My name is Keith Stammer. I am the Emergency Management Director for the City of Joplin and the surrounding Jasper County. I'm the one that put the little brochures on your chair. This is my gift for you to take home with you. I hand these out at all of the meetings. Mitch is smiling because he's seen me do this for years. And uh, I keep these at the house. My wife invites friends over, and as they leave, I hand these to them as they go out the door. Uh, how to be safe, how to have a kit, how to have a plan, uh, some suggestions on disaster planning rather specific. Uh, I don't think at this point we need to worry much about volcanoes in Joplin, Missouri, nor do we need to worry about coastal flooding. We're about 1,000 feet above sea level. I used to say no to earthquakes, but if you've been to Oklahoma lately, we've given up on that as well. They seem to approach up here. So this is yours, and please take that home. We want to talk a little bit about the <coughs> aftermath of the Joplin tornado from May 22, 2011 at approximately 5.30, 5.41, somewhere along in there, depending on when you actually do the timing. Our first speaker this morning, or this afternoon, I guess actually is the case, is Chief. And so we set that tone, and we told people, we need, if we ask you for this, we need it. It's not a matter of we just like to have it. Um, and so that worked out very successful for us. And by the way, I did get the use of that helicopter um, that I needed. Um, so uh, another thing that we, we uh, did and, and kind of set the tone with was the uh, setting the tone with our departments getting back into the neighborhoods and letting the citizens know that we were still there to protect them. Obviously, we lost two fire stations. We had been devastated along with the rest of the city. Um, I lost th those two stations and about five fire trucks. Luckily, not a scratch on one of my firefighters, so they were all still able to respond, but no vehicles, no stations, no anything. Um, it was my goal as quickly as I could, and we did it within 36 hours, to get them in replacement vehicles and get them back at their station sites to show people we're still here to protect you. We took a big hit too, but we are still standing and we're going to help you. And if you look at this bottom picture I, I here, need to interject if I may. Have at it. Not only did you set the tone for everybody else, you yourself suffered a uh, personal situation as well it, while it, all this yeah. was going on. And I do have that, I think, in a slide. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure that you, uh, he will not talk about himself very much here. I want to make sure he did. So um, this is one of the first fire stations that we had afterwards. Of course, the very first one was... Uh, a 10 by 10 pop-up shelter from Walmart because that's all we had and four lawn chairs and that's what our guys stayed in during the daytime and literally from sun up until sun down and sometimes a little later that's what they would stayed in in their stations and again I, I, my crews were fantastic not one complaint not till a few years later obviously but uh, at the time no one complained um, and it was fantastic because the people would drive by and they would still see their fire trucks there ready to serve them and that's the other thing you've got to remember is, yeah, we've got a city of 50,000 people, and about one-third of them have all been affected. Um, and about one-third of the city was gone. But two-thirds of the city was still standing and still needed our everyday, day-in, day-out service. And so it was up to us to still provide that. And so obviously we were working special uh, shifts as well, and those were 36-hour shifts. So they'd work a 24-hour shift doing their normal duties and then uh, a 12-hour shift in the disaster area. And those usually turned into about 16-hour shifts. That's just the way it kind of worked out. Uh, the next thing we did was uh, with the cleanup, and this was not my part, but this was our public works department. They did a fantastic job with it. Um, and we went from this with all the debris everywhere to this in 10 weeks. 10 weeks' time. Went from complete disaster to somewhat virtually cleaned up which was, again, a fantastic feat done by uh, Public Works, by, our, uh, by the uh, Corps of Engineers who helped out, and, and through the help of FEMA, uh, through the expedited debris removal process. Uh, again, but we set the tone with that. We told people, we want this cleaned up. We want to get back to rebuilding because we don't want to lose population. We don't want to lose people uh, moving away to other cities. We want to try to maintain our population. Uh, the next one was uh, this one down here, again, not one that I was personally involved in, but one our city uh, planners and our uh, city government was involved in, and that's our temporary housing area. Um, by the way, uh, after Katrina, once uh, FEMA got here, I got uh, scolded several times and uh, haven't been for a few years, but I used to call them, because uh, what did everybody get in, in uh, Katrina? FEMA trailers, right? Uh, that was a bad word, and if FEMA, did anyone from FEMA here? Okay, good. I'm still safe. Um, 
If I said FEMA trailer, I would get scolded afterwards because they are now THUs or temporary housing units. Still a trailer. I mean, I'm from Missouri, um, and you show me a house with wheels under it, that's a trailer house. Um, but anyway, um, we still put in 700 different homes up here to try to keep our population and give them a place to go and stay, at least on a temporary basis. And they constructed this from vacant farmland, basically, to like I said, 700 different mobile housing units installed, ready to go, being lived in, in about 45 days. Again, a fantastic feat. If you would talk to people and say, hey, we need this done, they would look at you and go, we can't do it in that short of a time period. But we told folks, we're ready to go, this is where we want it, this is what we're going to do. And it got done. Um, I, one of the ones I don't show the picture of, and I couldn't find a picture of it, was our temporary fire stations. Of course, we had two destroyed, and we needed something other than pop-up tents. And again, our first was RVs, and four guys in an RV, in a small RV, that gets real tight real quick. Uh, so they brought us in some uh, temporary fire stations that we lived in for about two years while we rebuilt our, our new ones. Um, and I know I haven't talked to the chief about this, but I would invite you to go look at those. There's, uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, one's out on South Main Street or South Hearns Boulevard, and then one's out on uh, uh, West Marquardt or West 13th. Uh, and they're very nice stations. They turned out great, and uh, they're a real uh, asset to the community. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we were talking to the Corps of Engineers, and, and we, uh, when I was talking with them, I said, you know, we need to get back in our stations. We need to get the guys something. And I said, we need to do this fairly quickly. And this was a, probably about the second week in June. Um, and I had a really nice general from uh, the Corps of Engineers. He goes, son, I'm going I'm to build you two temporary stations, and it's going to happen so fast your head will spin. And I was like, well, that's fantastic. When do you think we'll be moving in? Because, it, it, you know, at the time, it wasn't going to take much to make my head spin. He goes, you'll be in there by Christmas. <laughs> And I'm thinking, June to Christmas, that's not, my head's not spinning here. And I said, well, sir, I just, I just don't find that acceptable. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, that's just not acceptable. I said, I want to move in quicker. And he goes, well, when do you want in there? I said, look, it's 100 degrees out. My crews are sitting out under pop-up tents. I can't expect them to do that for a long period of time. I said, Nick, it's cold around here. I said, i got to get them in something more permanent. I said, I want to move in by July 4th. He said, I don't think we can do that. And I said, no's not an answer. And he was like, well, hang on. So he goes and talks to a couple of you guys, come back, goes, no problem. We moved in July 3rd. <laughs> and now my deputy chief on the way out said, I don't think the generals used to people telling him that. And I said, well, welcome to Joplin. <laughs> <laughs> so the next point I want to make is, in addition to setting the tone, you've got to remember that you're running a relay race. It's a race, and you're going to have a lot of different runners in this, and you're going to hand off that baton a lot of times. Well, the first part of the race that uh, we were running was Lane and I running it. We were running in conjunction, basically both hanging on the baton because we were in emergency response mode. That's our thing. It's fast. It's a sprint, and we're trying to get to the end as quick as we can to, to uh, save as many people as we can and recover those that didn't survive. And so we're running that first vital, speedy leg of this relay race. Well, after we got done, then we had to hand it off to our emergency planners and our public works department and, and some of our others. When they got done, they had to hand it off to the community planners. When they're done, they're going to hand it off to the finance department to recover all of our costs. It's a race, and it's a race that's going to go on long term. We're still running. The city of Joplin is still running that race. I just took a few calls last week from our finance director as we're doing reimbursements from FEMA still dealing with this issue. So it's a long-term thing. Don't think you're going to go out for two or three weeks, take, a, take uh, care of your disaster, then pack up your stuff and go back uh, or go away. You're going to be running that race for a long time. I fully expect to retire in 10 years fully from the fire service. I anticipate that I'll still be answering questions about this disaster then. <laughs> so remember, you're in a relay race, and it's a, it ends up being a marathon by the time that you're done. So, the next thing was, if it happens, um, they will come. Obviously, you guys can pick out that I'm a baseball fan um, and what movie that's from. So, uh, so, you need to know your players. One of the things that was really great um, was I had met most of my counterparts from the region uh, around. And it's a three-state region. I knew folks from Oklahoma, from Kansas, and then, of course, from uh, southwest Missouri. And we've done a lot of extensive planning on um, terrorist and homeland security. Um, so we've done a lot of drills, a lot of different uh, discussions, a lot of group purchasing, and a lot of group planning 
uh, with those folks. And so I knew them by first name. I had them in my phone, uh, my cell phone. I could call them at any time, day or night. And that's, into, that's how I ended up making the first mutual aid request. We're on my cell phone driving, trying to do a wind, windshield survey um, of the city on my cell phone, calling folks going, hey, I need help. Most of them were already on the way because they'd saw the news coverage. Um, it also doesn't help when Mike Bettis gets on live TV and goes, if you're an emergency responder and you can hear this, come to Joplin. Um, which, of course, I met him about a month later and I hope to see him again. Um, and I told him, I said, if you ever do that again, I'll come find you and kill you. Uh, because they did. They came from everywhere. And that first night was still a particularly dangerous weather time. So we had to go out and round up a bunch of those folks because they were all freelancing. None of them reported in. And so we needed to round them up so we could warn them of weather events and get them onto the search grids that we, we'd already laid out or were planning out. So um, what these two pictures are is this is me on the step stool because, of course, you can see I'm kind of short. So in order for everybody to see me, I have to stand up on something. Uh, but this is me uh, giving a morning briefing at about uh, 5 a.m. Uh, well, that's probably about 6 a.m. Um, to uh, the first group of firefighters that are going out. or No, this is the second group of firefighters going out for search and rescue that day. Uh, if you can see this, this is a, a bridge that's right to the side of our main fire station, um, and it was lined with fire trucks. The thing that you can't tell is from this point on, which it's about a half mile over here to our fire station where all the fire trucks are lined up, for about another mile the other direction behind the camera, there's that many fire trucks lined up behind it again. Um, and so when I walked out that morning, I see all these trucks there and folks getting their grid maps and their search assignments and the incident action plans, I'm thinking, wow, this is great, this is fantastic, and I see my city engineer, which is here somewhere, um, not in the room, but he's here at the, the conference, and he's sitting there, he's kind of doing this, and I'm like, well, what, what's wrong, David? And he goes, well, he goes, uh, I'm just wondering if that bridge will hold all that weight. <laughs> Bad time to tell me. Um, but he came back about 30 minutes later and goes, no, we're fine. He goes, it'll do it. So anyway... Uh, uh, again, you've got to know who you're dealing with beforehand. Don't wait to meet your, your counterparts next door or within a few counties of you the day of the disaster. That's too late. Start learning their names now when you don't have to have it. Um, bought, make those bonds and relationships early on. So this is our grid. Um, this was really fantastic. We had this the, the, uh, the second morning or the, the morning after the storm. Uh, this came from the result of that helicopter flight. Uh, basically, we had our GIS department uh, uh, make out this, uh, uh, this map here. I came back, drew a line through, told our GIS folks uh, basically the distances to draw the widths, and uh, um, they went back and did that. We gridded it off, and this is what we made our search assignments off of. It was done very quickly, uh, very rapidly, but what I would tell you is, is how many of you have heard do windshield surveys? <clears throat> from your cars and stuff. Okay, in a tornado, impossible. Um, we sent a couple police officers out to do that as well. Lane, how long was it before we heard from them again? Four hours. Yeah. So really pretty impossible for, for you to get through town. That's why we commandeered the helicopter to do it. Um, if you get a big disaster like this, get in the air where you can get around and, and, uh, and get a good visual of what you're dealing with. Uh, we were able to do it in about 20 minutes in the helicopter. So big, big bonus. Think outside your box. And by the way, if you hear FEMA or someone refer to the blue whale, that's what this is. Because everybody says it kind of looks like a whale. <laughs> kind of got a little tail, I guess. But All right, so again, you've got, uh, you've got a lot of mutual aid and volunteers. Be willing to accept them. No department, no county, no state, no organization can do it on their own. No one can. Uh, I don't care if it's New York City themselves, the biggest fire department in the country, they could not handle 9-11 just like we couldn't handle this. No one is big enough to do this on their own. Let people come and help you, and that's hard. That's hard for firefighters, hard for police officers, hard for EMS folks to let folks come in and help you. Uh, as I said before, uh, learn who your counterparts are. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, the department's going to self-dispatch. It's just going to happen. You've got to figure out a way of dealing with it. Uh, someone's going to see something on TV, and they're going to go, by golly, they need my help. They just don't know it yet. We're going. Um, and so they show up. So, and that's, that's fine as long as they're working within your, uh, your command uh, and getting the assignments from you. If they, and basically what it comes down to is make sure that you gather those folks up, get them worked into your organization and out searching where you want them to or doing what you want them to do. If not, show them the door or the city limits. 
Um, we actually had to escort two departments out of the city of Jotham because they refused to participate in our command system. Uh, one of them, a rather large Missouri uh, Municipal Fire Department. Um, I was quite shocked and embarrassed for them. Um, and then the other was a very small uh, volunteer fire department from uh, down in Arkansas. And then people always want to help. Everybody wants to come and be a part, and they want to feel like they've contributed to making the situation better. Let them. Every job's important, and trust me, in a disaster of this size, there are thousands of things that need done that you haven't even thought of yet. Let people come and help. It may be just washing clothes for the firefighters. We had a group come down, uh, you may have heard of them, Operation Barbecue Relief. The very first disaster they ever responded to was our tornado, Joplin, Missouri. Guy walks in, he said, Chief, I'd like to cook you guys dinner. Well, I had Red Cross and Salvation Army and some other folks, but I could just see in his eyes he really wanted to be a part of helping us. And I said, you know, set up out back and, and it'll be great. He was there for three weeks. And it was fantastic. It was good food, too. Um, who, who can go wrong with barbecue every evening? So, um, But uh, anyway, let people help you and find them a job. Even if, it's, even if it's something just small, it's still something that's important. Every task is important. So... Um, I think this is my last one, and this is the one Keith was alluding to, and I always, I always started asking at the end of all of my presentations and all of my, my times I talk is, are you prepared? Now, obviously, the first thing th everybody thinks about is, well, am I pre prepared professionally? Well, yes, I do mean that, but I want to go a little bit further and say, are you prepared personally? Um, and I'm just going to bet that you're not, because I know I wasn't. And I can tell you that because that's my house. Um, this is what was left of it, and this is it being debris uh, cleaned up. Uh, this was my 35-foot uh, fifth wheel that was sitting in my neighbor's living room. Um, and then that is my house sitting out at the street for debris removal by FEMA, by the FEMA contractors. If you haven't seen your home and all of your possessions and everything that your kids knew and grew up with, sitting out in a debris pile in front of a piece of property that you've lived in for 17 years of your life, yeah, you're not ready for that, and neither was I. And I, I can tell you, I didn't, don't want to go through it again. But I lost my home as well as three other firefighters. We had several police officers, several public works uh, folks that did. Um, and we still had to do our jobs through this. Now, I sent the firefighters home, um, and I think Lane sent his police officers home to deal with their things. But, you know, I'm sitting here, and I'm the fire chief. I'm the head of the, the fire department. I'm, you know, one of the emergency uh, management uh, positions. And I'm thinking, okay, where am I going to best serve the city and myself and, and my family? And that was being at work. And so I stayed at work. I didn't go and take care of my personal, uh, personal issues. I stayed there because if I left, you know, what would that tell everybody else? And I thought, I've got to kind of be that example to folks. I've got to stay here and show them that even though even I'm down, that I'm not going to let it beat me, that we're going to get through this and we're going to work through it and we're going to survive this. And so that's... Uh, you know, that's one of the, the, I think, probably the last point that I really want to make is just start thinking about things, be prepared, set the tone, and set the example for your folks. So, Very that's, good. That's Thank mine. you, Chief. Appreciate that. Stand there for just a minute, if you would, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Questions for Chief Randles? Yes, sir. A little off the safety end, but how did you deal with stuff like tire damage? I uh -huh. played Field, Illinois, years ago. That yeah. That was about $100,000. Tire damage when they okay. get burning away. We, we actually contacted a couple of our tire contractors. They set up portable sites in the city, and any fire truck or any emergency vehicle that had a tire issue, we sent them to those locations. And, and we had a lot of them. Uh, and uh, for the first week or so, it was all free. They didn't charge us a penny. Um, and then after that, they did it on a contract basis. Somebody over here? Yes, sir. Actually, two questions. Mike Middleton with MoDOT. Oh. Um, we responded, and you guys were very helpful too. We responded that night, but a couple things we wondered about in retrospect is we did respond without any kind of care to safety of gas lines, lines, and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, would you have advice now at that spot of if that's just what needs to happen on a public works kind of department, DOT kind of works? Because it has kind of come up a little bit. Mm -hmm. We just went. We didn't think nothing else about it. Yeah. Um, you, you know... Looking back on it, you know, that's probably all we could do at that time. Uh, you know, when we talked to our public works folks, our public works director and assistant director, I think they were probably talking with y'all. We just needed the streets open so we could get the emergency equipment in. 
And so our biggest goal, um, you know, that first evening, other than just, you know, trying to rescue the folks we could quickly, um, was to get access for the emergency equipment because you don't want to go carrying that stuff two and three blocks. Um, so, yeah, I think that was all you could do. I mean, we obviously had some natural gas fires, um, and, you know, fueled fires from the, the gas lines. And um, as I like to describe it, we kind of had uh, our city dying by paper cut. It was death by paper cut. It was about 8,000 of them, though. Um, you know, the city ran out of water, the city didn't have dependable gas service, electricity was on and off for the next uh, several days, and so we had a lot of problems with everything. But as far as that goes, I think that's about all you can do. You've got to get access to get the rescues done. And uh, it does create certain safety problems that on a normal day, we wouldn't take that risk. But in those days, you, sometimes you have to suspend your normal operation uh, method to get it done. The second question is, you did hold your line, you led your group, but who ended up coming to you and saying, sir, you need to go home now? Uh, my covered you. Yeah. Who was that person that you have to have in your command staff that can have that kind of look at you and say, you got, you got to do something different for a little bit? My city manager about a week later just looked at me and goes, you, you need to go home. And, I was, and, of course, my first response was, I don't have one. And, uh, um, and he, he, you know, I knew what he meant. And uh, so he ordered me home, and I went home and slept for about, I went to my sister's house and slept for about eight, eight hours that night. Um, but, you know, my wife was, uh, was instrumental in, in my recovery. My wife and my son and my daughter, uh, they stepped in and did a lot of things. And, and, uh, um, and basically, they're the ones that were in charge of our, they're the ones that are responsible for where we are today, um, not me. So, uh, but yeah, city manager was, uh, was the one that had to do it, and, and he did. Mayor? Well, um, first of all, I don't want to ever miss the chance to welcome my two chiefs back to town. Uh, technology changes. Technology has changed in five years since our tornado. Um, a lot of people carry smartphones, and there's a great way to communicate if your towers are up. Um, but now drones are very prevalent. Mm -hmm. What role do you see cities, municipalities needing to invest or to coordinate aerial drones as far as rescue and, and, and understanding the depth and breadth of a disaster, do you see that playing a, a greater role in the future? It, you know, I think if you could get, uh, at, at least as, as far as I know about drones today, um, you know, the military versions where they can fly miles and what have you, I, I think that would be great for doing, um, you, you know, uh, like those surveys, the damage surveys, damage assessments. <laughs> Uh, and what have you. The current drones that, that like I know I can get, they don't have the range really um, to do like a full damage assessment for our storm. Uh, but you know, really any way you can get up above the scene and get kind of a bird's eye view of it, I think would be helpful. So I, I think that as, as that technology continues to develop and there's such an interest in it now, I, I think it just will continue to develop. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be a huge port thing in uh, disaster recovery. So, yes sir? Uh, I'm I'm an RC um, pilot. Mm -hmm. I'm also registered with the AFAA, mm -hmm. um, following all the guidelines and a member of the AMA, which is the coordinating group. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much what the range is is six minutes about. That's what you have with the multi rotor. Mm -hmm. But if you are like a glider with a camera on it, since it's able to ride on wind currents, you can go a lot further, but you're limited to light of sight as right. with the FAA ruling on that. And they are changing that, but I've been working with emergency management on that. I know a lot of other people as well, but still you can't, like you said, you can't get any better uh, surveillance than having a manned aircraft going over there and yeah. cost more, but yeah, um, it's a lot safer and a lot more accurate. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, the EMS helicopter we we commandeered that night uh, was uh, just tremendously uh, valuable to us, and it, it allowed us to get a lot of things done in a short period of time, and so it was great. So, uh, but you know, I think it, it, if you're going to shut me down here, uh, <laughs> I, I think my final thing is just to, to leave you with this thought that uh, you, you know I think we were successful because we had a lot of the right leadership in place and. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about um, the folks that I had working for me and the folks that were in other positions in the city. Uh, we just had a lot of good people. Uh, we still do. I mean, don't get me wrong. We still have a lot of good people out there. Um, you know, we had great folks in the police department. We had a good uh, uh, partnership with our emergency medical responders, our EMS providers, because the fire department doesn't do that here in Joplin. 
Um, but we had a great relationship with them. We had a great relationship with our hospitals, our school district, um, and just a lot of great leadership and, and uh, uh, folks out there that were just can-do players. And um, while we did a lot of things, I think while there was a lot of success here through money and other things, uh, what I think made the city of Joplin uh, successful was uh, the people and uh, that can-do attitude that, uh, that is prevalent in this area. And so I just, I always want to appreciate uh, those folks for what they did. Um, it, I say it was them that made the city successful. So. Very good. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. And thank you for that applause. That is the sum and total of his payment for driving up here from Texas. To be with you. <laughs> Lane, if you would please come up here while he's doing that. Uh, this is Lane Roberts, who is currently serves as the director of the Department of Public Safety for the state of Missouri. He's a 42-year veteran of law enforcement. He served as the Joplin Police Chief from 2007 to 2014. Uh, he was instrumental in the local, uh, in the coordinated local, state, and federal effort to respond to the EF5 tornado that struck Joplin on May 22nd. Uh, sir, I've downloaded your complete bio off the state site here. I shan't embarrass you by reading out every last little detail on it, but suffice to say, in my humble but accurate opinion, it's been a long time since we've had somebody in this position that is so eminently qualified. Chief, if you would put that. Sorry, I still call him Chief. I have to. It's just the way it is. I can tell you, I like being called a Chief, and I wish I still had my snappy outfit like Nick, so I can feel like I'm getting on stage here. Um, first of all, um, I don't have a PowerPoint. Uh, I'm just going to try to capitalize on some of the things that Mitch said. First of all, this thing about having good people in place, the night that incident occurred, uh, we proved a point that I know both of us have talked to our own uh, cities about several times. Some of our staff, particularly our command staff, have take-home vehicles. If you're from a small agency or, or an agency of any size, there are people who worry about the cost of that. The night the tornado struck, the command staff got in their vehicles and did not respond to City Hall or to the police department, they went to the area of concern. Now, personally, I always found the, the tabletop exercise to be utterly boring because they're ridiculous. People plan out this series of events that just get stupid by the time you get done and you just want to fold your ditty bag and go home. You think about the sequence of events that happened to us. An EF-5 tornado touched down inside the city limits, really? It takes out two of your fire departments that were supposed to be the primary responders to that. Your mutual aid can't get to you because the streets are blocked. These from West Side support can't get to you because the streets are blocked. The hospital that you're relying on gets destroyed. The neighboring community that you're expecting to help you on that end gets taken out by 60%. Add that up. Does that sound like the kind of thing that could happen? And yet it did. When our commanders got on site, whether or not they actually took in everything they got in all those emergency management classes, or maybe they got it by osmosis. They made good decisions. We had people on the ground who knew what they were doing. And I can't speak for Mitch, but I'll bet you I'm not too far off. A lot of what we did was facilitate for people. And we did some things you wouldn't normally do, as an example. We were having trouble getting medevac flights in and out because of all the people flying around wanting to see what was going on. So. We got concerned about how do I how do I put an end to this? So I called the FAA and I said, I need to close the airspace over Joplin. He said, okay, well you certainly have that authority. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so we closed the airspace over Joplin. I said, yeah, do that. So people had to call and ask us permission to come over Joplin. Now the president swooped in there like you own the place, but I guess you know he's a busy guy. We cut him some slack, didn't run the <laughs> The fact is that they never taught me that police chief school, and I'll bet it was never on your list of, of curriculum at the chief school. There's some innovation that goes with this. The ability, as Mitch said, to think outside the box and do things you wouldn't normally do. Uh, I want to touch on one other thing before I get to the list of items I wanted to touch on. I'm going to go against conventional wisdom here. If you remember September 11th, the big lesson was communication. <coughs> We need a way to integrate communication so everybody's on one system. Now, we are better off today than we were on September 11th. We have a thing called an ACU 1000. Many of you know what that is. It basically allows a number of, of communication systems to hit a focal point and then go back somewhere else. 
I would submit to you that despite what people have told you, that a single communication system is not necessarily a good idea. What we found was that when we had a single receiving point, and that we could then send that to the ACU 1000, which would communicate directly to those various command posts, what that allowed us to do was have a single point entry, but allowed all of those agencies that responded to help us, and there were 400 plus of them, I had about 1,200 cops out there at any one time, all working with different supervisors, different radio equipment, uh, different policies and procedures. So what this allowed us to do was dispatch from one location, but allowed them to retain control and work under their own policies and procedures. Now, there may be people who disagree with me, but I would advocate that you at least consider uh, that maybe that one-point uh, communication system isn't the best situation. Okay, so let's talk about security. I was in... Uh, Washington State when St. Helens erupted. I thought I knew something about disasters. How do you go about protecting a crime scene that is a mile wide by six miles long? Well, that's easy. Just stream, stream crime scene tape runs, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? That didn't work very well. You heard some discussion today about when things don't work, quit, and they talk about a permitting process. Well, I probably know somebody really close to my heart who actually came up with that idea, and it didn't work. Okay. It didn't work because we were using what we were accustomed to, which was like an airliner situation. But we wound up with a lot of mad citizens. Okay. So the end result was we had to abandon that. That meant we were going to have to let an awful lot of people into the disaster area. The question I get asked a lot is, how did you deal with looting? And let me just say to you that looting is, a, is not accurate. We had no looting. Looting is what occurred in the watch riots. Looting is breaking into people's buildings and stealing things. What we had here was opportunistic theft. What little was left of these people's lives was wrapped up in that debris. And our challenge is how are you going to go about protecting it? So we called all of the officers who came to us every single day, and we said to them, we don't know who the good guys and the bad guys are, but those guys have to be able to get back to their stuff. So your mantra is this. Be aggressive. Be assertive. And by golly, be nice. Don't you re-victimize our victims because you think you're some kind of crime fighter. And we actually, like Mitch, actually asked one fairly large police department not to come back because they couldn't seem to figure out the difference between serving people uh, and forcing them all on their behalf or enforcing them on them. Uh, so we asked them not to come back. One of the things that I learned from this, and you've heard some discussion about this today, when everybody goes home, you will be left behind to face your citizens. And everything they do on your behalf, all those uniform attack train killers out there, everything they did will become my responsibility after they go home and I'm left to face my community. I know all of you have heard that leadership after disaster sometimes the leaders go away. I think a lot of people assume that's because, well, the, it's the stress that went with it, it shortened their career. I would submit to you that some of them go away because they were asked to. Because two or three years later, when people are looking at that event to the benefit of retrospect, and they start getting angry, and they've got to be angry at somebody, it's the officials who were making decisions at the time, or the people who made decisions on your behalf while they were here. So you have to retain control, as Mitch said. That sounds really good. Now let me just tell you, working for the state, I have heard in fairly high circles that the state feels that when they get there, they need to take control because the locals don't know how to deal with something of this magnitude. They believe that. We believe otherwise. And so the challenge is how do you find that balance? How do you retain control so that when everybody else goes home and you're faced with your citizens, that they're looking at you and feeling satisfied with the product that you gave them? It's a balance and it's not easy. The reality is the state has a lot of resources we don't, as the federal government does. FEMA, I've heard them bad mouth since Katrina to the point that it's almost nauseous. And I will tell you that in my mind, those are stand-up folks. They stood shoulder to shoulder with us through the whole thing. That's that uh, mobile site that you saw, multiply those 750 trailers by two and a half times the average size of a family, and you're going to come with 1,500 plus people. Within our city limits, we had a whole new city. What was different, however, is that in this city we had paved roads, we had a community center, we had a playground for the kids, and 
every time one of those units vacated, the unit came out. They did not remain there to be re, uh, uh, resided by somebody else. They removed them. If we got a call there and we had a problem, and we went to FEMA and we said, we need these people evicted, they were gone. FEMA worked with us and became true partners. We had some discussion about familiarity. St. Helens gave us a great example. We made more mistakes. I mean, you, could, you could fill this room with paper with all the mistakes we made at that, partly because we didn't know the players. In Joplin, as a lot of the Midwest, as, as Keith could attest, we spooled up in that EOC fairly often. We have occasional bad weather here, in case that's a newsflash. Because of that, we had worked with people. And it's just not knowing who the person is, but you also have to know their competencies. Because you don't want to resort to somebody who will fail regardless of their position. And you know it. If you don't know it, you may give them that responsibility anyway. So that familiarity is more than just a matter of being friends and knowing what their name is. It's also knowing their competencies. We benefited from a lot of experience of other people. Katrina was the big one for us. I will tell you that in my mind, I didn't make a lot of the decisions that, that that got us through this thing prior. I made a lot of decisions by putting the right people in the right place. I did make one decision. My department was fairly young, so uh, I had the advantage of having gone through uh, and sending people to Katrina, knowing people were there. I called everybody in the morning after the, the tornado, and they weren't happy about that because they had some other obligations, as you might expect. And I said to them, we are not going to be New Orleans. Focus on your mission. Stay on your mission. What happened when the cops became search and rescue in New Orleans? Anarchy. It didn't take days or weeks. It took hours. Total and complete anarchy. Somebody's got to maintain the rule of law or it will become irrelevant. So, here's the hard thing for the cops to swallow. Search and rescue is the purview of the firefighters. They, we support search and rescue. We don't become search and rescue. Our focus is the rule of law. What we, the phrase we've used a great deal, uh, I, I think I know where it came from, but I won't credit one person because we've all used it a lot. Stay in your swim lane. One of the reasons that things worked well in Joplin is because everybody did what they were supposed to do. There wasn't any political spotlight hunting. Everybody was focused on the mission. And when everybody does what they're supposed to do, then government does what government's supposed to do instead of what government usually does. Now, I don't know why we all stayed in our swim lane. We just did. And the end result was we got the product that we were looking for. Uh, I think an awful lot of people still look at this recovery and say, well, how? I can tell you why. Because we stayed in our, our swim lane, but I can't tell you why we did that. Because it's not what we normally do. So I think it requires a focus to be able to do that. We had some difficulty with self-deployment as well. A lot of agencies came to help and they wanted to help. I think we squandered some of those, those resources early on. I would suggest to you if you have a staging area, you might want to have a backup staging area because the staging area we normally have took a direct hit. So we didn't have one. And I think we squandered some of those resources because we didn't know where to bring them in order to properly deploy them. And we didn't want them just running the muck all over the place. I want to echo something that, that, uh, that Mitch said, but I, I really want to uh, give some some kudos to our public works department. Uh, and they worked with MoDOT a great deal. In 24 hours, we were able to get in and do search and rescue and security. How they did that, I don't know. I remember back, what Keith, probably 20 years, there was that huge snowstorm up in the Northeast. And they actually had snowplow drivers who were needing uh, emotional uh, assistance. They needed psychological assistance because they couldn't see they're trying to plow roads, but they don't know if it's a car or a person, and they're, and they're worried about hurting people. Well, imagine what it must have been like for public works, trying to clean up this debris, not knowing who might be in that debris or what there was. So you know, I, I can't credit them enough, and I think what it goes to show is that it was a community effort. Our role was fairly easily defined, and we each stayed on our mission. Uh, I do think we successfully uh, uh, complimented one another. We supported search and rescue. Search and rescue alerted us to security issues. We stayed on the mission. But I'll just tell you that Joplin uh, 
even today, uh, I'm, I'm from the Northwest. I grew up in Oregon, Washington. And if you'd asked me six years ago where I was from, I'd have said I'm from Oregon. Ask me where I'm from today, it's Joplin, Missouri. This community uh, is remarkable. Its recovery is remarkable. The response was remarkable. Uh, but it was community-wide. It wasn't because an element or two uh, did the job. And then, then finally, I want to credit our former city manager, Mark Rohr. Mark said something to us repeatedly, but I remember especially the very first time he said it. And he, and he got kind of steely-eyed about it. And he said, we are not going to be defined by what's happened to us. We will be defined by how we responded to it. And like Mitch, I've done presentations all over the country on this tornado. Everybody wants to see the sexy stuff. They want to see the debris and that kind of stuff. But what they're interested in, the reason I'm there, is to talk about the recovery. Why has Joplin recovered differently than everybody else? And I can tell you it is because, one, everybody stayed in their swim lane. Two, uh, it was a community-wide effort. But three, uh, and maybe the takeaway from this was like that FAA thing, was the ability and the willingness to be innovative and support from the top levels of our city government to, that allowed us that kind of discretion and latitude to be innovative uh, and be able to do things that need to do to get through the unexpected. Uh, there's just no checklist for this. Questions? A question for the fire chief. I've seen some of the pictures. There's lots of folks on the debris files. Some of them are appropriately attired and others you know, and I understand that they're, that they're visibly upset because they've lost everything. Did you, did you try to sort of help those people stay safe? We, we did as much as we could. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that also went out um, was a bunch of requests for stuff. Um, and I, I can tell you, one, one of the mistakes I made, which was actually, I think, pretty humorous now looking back on it, was uh, I had some folks from Walmart come to me that I had known for several years and say, Chief, what do you need? What do you need? We want to help. We want to be a part of it. And I said, look, I, you know, I don't know right now. I mean, we're just a few hours into this. I'm just, I'm just not sure. He says, no, really, we want to help you. And I said, look, I need some Gatorade. I need some water. I need some ice for both. And I said, I need some underwear. For, for folks, because I said the guys are going out, they're uh, you know they're doing all this stuff. It's still raining. It rained for three days afterwards, um, uh, and uh, uh, you know I said that's what I need. And they said, well, how much do you need? And I said, oh, I don't know, uh, a, a truckload. Okay, <laughs> now what do you envision I have in my mind when I say a truckload? A pickup truck, absolutely. What does Walmart have in mind when I say a truckload? A fifty-three foot tractor trailer yes. and that's what they showed up with I got a 53 foot truckload of Gatorade a 53 foot truckload full of water a 50 foot 3 foot truckload full of ice and that ice lasts for a long days even a long time in 80 degree even 80 90 degree weather um, and a 53 foot truckload full of underwear <laughs> and towels and other stuff um, but we also got it. for the next one. <laughs> we did. And I didn't have to wash them either. Um, but we also asked for gloves and safety glasses and those types of things. So we did, we did get a lot of that. And at one point we had, I want to say, was it 10 million pair of gloves donated at one time? It was some outrageous number. Same with water. I mean, we got water donated by truckloads. I think we may still have some if you want to take some home, please. Um, but... Uh, um, we did ask for it, and we did hand that out uh, so just, to folks. I mean, if, if your yeah. folks were working in the debris pile, and they saw a homeowner or somebody yeah. without some kind of protective gear, they just took Yeah, and, and we, would, we would literally send cases out with the crews of gloves and just say, hey, you tear a pair, throw them away, get a new pair. Something else so that we did, we actually had mobile tetanus units out Thank there. Thank you. Also, the question we were going to yeah. ask. Yeah. They were offering tetanus shots out in the field. Yep. In addition to that, if you, there's a, both of us have larger presentations, you'll see a lot of people wearing masks. Yep. Because the area that where they're working in, because it was old job, well, yeah, all the, a lot of asbestos, right. yep. gas, and the medical fuel, and Absolutely. all that debris. Yeah. And, and if I may, uh, uh, the, uh, the total we got from the health department was they handed out 17,000 tetanus shots. That's great. Mm. Yep. And we had a question up here from somebody. Yes, please. Chief, uh, your mobile deployment, you still had control of the rest of the city. Yes. So, um, uh, Jim McIntyre, Brentwood Police Department, St. Louis. So we uh, we went through a situation a couple years ago. We did uh, 12 on, 12 off. How long? What kind of deployment did you do, and how did you?
because you control the rest of the city. We work primarily the 12 on 12 off as well. We, we, we used a lot of those resources that came to us to take care of security in the disaster area. We implemented a curfew so you couldn't go in there after a certain time of day. The National Guard occupied most of those checkpoints. But we had very little real theft. Uh, I, I think we made 122 total arrests. As, but it's mostly stealing metal, that kind of thing. But the reason for that is because on any given night for that first month, you could have walked across that area on the hoods of police cars and never touched them around <laughs> because we saturated it with those folks. Uh, without that resource, we'd have been really hard pressed to get the, the job done. That left us free to be able to deal with the remainder of our community. We still need all the same resources. And as you might expect, we had a, a greater population because a lot of people were coming to town. Uh, and we had to deal with that. And then when we went to the debris removal, we had upwards of 300 debris removal trucks on the street at any one time every single day. And you would think then that your traffic collision rate would go up. It actually went down. Uh, partly because I think we did a good job. Uh, a lot of public information, but also because people knew they were out there and they were just being extra careful. Our, our, our accident rate actually went down. But it was those resources that came to us that allowed us to absorb that additional work while we went ahead and continued to focus mostly on the remainder of our community. We did extend our shifts a bit. Yeah, and then my follow-up is just uh, how long did you run those four? We, we found that we could run them only about two weeks before they, we really saw a diminish in, in their yeah, job. We had, uh, we had uh, uh, basically a 20 or 10-hour <coughs> schedule anyway, so we were only extending it by two, uh, which makes a huge difference. Uh, we stayed in that mode for probably the better part of a month before we actually gave it up. And I gotta, I gotta tell you, I don't want to short on time. But You're fine, Keith. You're fine. There was a, a couple of instances that that will forever be iconic to me. We had some officers, I believe they were from Kansas City, came into an Arby's here in town and got a standing ovation, uh, and people <coughs> bought their lunch for them. Now, for those of us who are dealing with Ferguson at the moment, let me just tell you, uh, I remember those things, and it, it sort of restores my faith that people still know who's doing the work. Uh, that was kind of an iconic moment. The other one was, I was thinking, as Mitch was talking about walking into walls when you get tired, uh, I'm a little older than Mitch, and I don't handle those long shifts as well as I used to. So, you know, I'm not like I'm going to go home before he does. He's a firefighter. I'm a police <laughs> <laughs> So if he's staying, I'm staying. Yeah. <laughs> so about 41 hours into this thing, uh, and I'm starting not to function real efficiently, the governor came in. Now, I'm from Oregon and Washington. We wear plaid, Pendleton, flannel shirts with flaps on the pockets, and we use yeah, we had stuff. <laughs> The governor comes and he's wearing an orange flannel shirt, flaps on the pockets and the sleeves rolled up. And we shook hands and, and I knew him a little bit and said, Chief Aiden, I said, Governor Miller, I said, but I like your shirt. I thought, shit, I just called the governor but I know that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> but you make bad decisions when you've been. <laughs> <laughs> Well, perhaps you didn't consider that quite so bad. Consider <laughs> <laughs> your current. Who else? Yes, sir. Follow-up question to what he was talking about. Uh, it seemed to me, uh, in the with the media coverage, when you guys were dealing with the theft, that you came out very strong uh, in in the response to those things. And, you know, and the media was really projecting. You know, if you do this, we are going to come down hard on you. Was that by design, or was that did that just uh, that, that, you know, that was my design. Uh, again, we had the experience of watching what had happened elsewhere, and I was darned it was going to happen on my watch. Uh, I was late in my career, and I was going to end it by, by becoming uh, a punching bag for a bunch of uh, petty thieves. So we said, you know, what's left of their lives is wrapped up in that debris. If you're intent on taking it, we're intent on taking it. On, in English. We're intent on taking your free uh, and mental. And we were pretty darn aggressive. And I will tell you that when you get that many police departments here who are able to implement that kind of philosophy and not offend people, that's pretty hot stuff. Uh, they did a great job. If I may build on that question, comment, uh, you made the comment about swim in your own lane kind of idea. One of our agreements amongst ourselves was whatever it is that you do, you do that and not somebody else's. So 
I would get phone calls about the fire department or about the police department. My comment was, this is the person you talk to, that's the person you talk to. So when those kind of questions came up from the media and somebody wanted a response, we all went, call him. <laughs> that way you get one voice for police, you get one voice for fire, you get one voice for health department. We had somebody in the back row back here. Yes, sir. Yeah, Carter Tharp, I'm with the Missouri Department of Natural Resources and the state on scene coordinator for Hazmat. And we <clears throat> rotated in for, for months down here. But my question is about the self deployments. Being a department head now, is there some way that you uh, might want to standardize the ability for departments before EOC has stood up or before SEMA has stood up to allow those departments to say from all across the state or the country? to say we're available and we want to help to be able to check in outside of taking somebody away from their operational duties at the incident. Yeah, the, answer, the answer is yeah. yes. I've had Michigan speak to the fire side, but, but uh, both police and fire have uh, deployment pro programs. Where we had the struggle was the ones that Mitch was talking about, the ones that self-deploy. Mm -hmm. They don't check to see if, if you need them or where you need them. And you, you can't ignore them. <coughs> We benefited from an awful lot of people who did exactly that. But because we didn't know they were coming or where they were, we weren't able to use those resources effectively. But both uh, police and fire have state uh, processes for doing that. Yeah, yeah and, and there's also, uh, you, you know, Missouri and uh, actually Texas does too, uh, uses Web EOC where you can check in on Web EOC. You can, send, you know, pull up that disaster. You can send a message and say, you know, hey, uh, you know, we're available. I've got, you know, X uh, available to send to you or what have you. And so those, those things are all available. And normally in a large disaster, you know, there are folks watching those messages very closely. So uh, I think that's one uh, one method. And of course, like uh, uh, Lane's uh, alluded to, we, we do have a, you know, a mutual aid process where we contact a coordinator who contacts, you know, the next level of depending on how high we're going to go. And, um, you, you know, and same for going outside the state. There's a process to go outside the state too if you need resources from, uh, you know, not within. So, Mayor, just a quick show of hands. Who was here on the ground helping us here? Wow, well, awesome. Well, from, thank you. From, from, thank you. From the thank citizens of Joplin, we are eternally grateful. Thank you so very much for coming to us at our hour of need. It really means the world. And on that note, I think we'll go ahead and end this session. If you two gentlemen wouldn't mind standing around for a few more minutes, those of you that have any questions you might want to have uh, personally, feel free to do so. Otherwise, thank you so very much. Before you leave, let me just tell you that uh, Jonathan also got this is probably the best words and managers I've ever known. He stammers after that. Mm -hmm.